Hi, I'm Dr. Rob Gerowitz, and I want to thank the parents for joining us today to learn more about their children's eyes and progressive myopia. But first of all, who am I? Well, besides being a 1981 graduate of the Illinois College of Optometry, over the years I've received a few awards. One of the ones that I'm most proud about is the fact that I was named one of the first fellows of the International Academy of Orthokeratology and Myopia Control. Recently, I became a member of the very prestigious International Society of Contact Lens Specialists and an adjunct clinical professor for the Chicago College of Optometry. Since the early 2000s, I've spoken around the country and indeed around the world, including almost every continent on the globe. But enough about me. How do our children use their eyes? Well, we all know there's a great deal of close-up work that they have to do, and that requires the use of tablets, PCs, and smartphones. And these days, with remote learning, that has increased dramatically. Then there's the fact that our kids also play on this technology, doing things that are not related to schoolwork. And they have a multitude of activities, including sports and music. All this close-up work can cause myopia, or nearsightedness, or short-sightedness. But what is it exactly? If we look at the picture on the left, we can see that the eye is looking at a faraway stop sign. As light enters the eye, it focuses in front of the light-sensitive retina, which is located at the back of the eyeball. Because it focuses in front of the retina, the image that, the, that it receives is actually blurred and out of focus. Many children experience what's called progressive myopia. And this is defined as lens increases in their glasses, for example, of more than a half diopter or half a degree in time periods that are less than one year. In other words, each year or each six months even, their eyes get worse and worse and their glasses get stronger and stronger. But what causes progressive myopia? There are a number of factors. Certainly, as we've already talked about, all the close-up work that our children have to do. And then there's a genetic factor of children of myopic parents. For example, if one parent is nearsighted, there's a two times risk for the child to be progressively myopic. But if both parents are nearsighted, the risk now goes to five times. And as we all have observed, Children of Asian descent are more prone to be nearsighted and experience progressive myopia. All around school, you can notice children that are wearing new glasses on a regular basis because their vision has gotten worse. And then there's a high-fat, sedentary lifestyle that we have all fallen into in this country because we're all sitting around watching our technology. So that's no big deal, is it? Your children just go to the eye doctor and get new glasses. But why is myopia bad for your child's eyes? Well, I consider this a debilitated lifestyle. If a person has to get up and put on glasses so they don't bump into the furniture, that's a form of debilitation. These children often have difficulty in sports because the vision they get through their glasses, although clear, may change or alter their depth perception. That means they're often picked last for teams, or may even get made fun of, and that creates self-image problems. Why is high myopia bad for everybody? Well, when the eye gets more nearsighted, what actually is happening is that it's stretching. It's getting longer front to back. The retina, that light-sensitive tissue in the back of the eye, which is like film in a camera, has to stretch and as it stretches, it may develop thin spots or weak areas that can rip and tear. When they pull away from their natural blood supply, that's called a retinal detachment. There may also be an increase of glaucoma and myopic macular degeneration, which can actually happen at early ages. Any of these three problems can cause permanent loss of sight. Currently, Myopia affects 1.6 billion people worldwide, 
That's 42% of the U.S. population, whereas 100 years ago it was only 5%, and in China it's over 90%. The doctors that practice myopia management know that by the middle of this century, over one half of the world's population will be nearsighted. This is indeed a worldwide epidemic. What can you do as a parent to help your children? The first thing that most doctors recommend is what we call 20-20-20. And that means taking a break from their work every 20 minutes, looking 20 feet away from their work for 20 seconds. This is also a good time to do some deep blinking because extended close-up work has an ability to dry out a person's eyes. So again, every 20 minutes looking 20 feet away for 20 seconds. Or in the case of your children, maybe at the end of each chapter in a book, at the end of a page of math problems, at the end of something that they have to write on the page. Next, don't allow them to wear glasses that are too strong or too weak. Studies have shown that glasses that are either too strong or too weak can cause progressive myopia. Don't let them read too close. What do I mean by that? This is an example of where a child or an adult should be reading their technology. What we've done is asked our assistant to hold her tablet with her knuckles on her cheekbone and her elbow extended. That is the correct distance to be reading at. Any closer can cause progressive myopia. Don't read in bed in the dark. Let your child read if they want to, but use proper lighting. Flashlights are right out. And Make sure that your children get good sleep and healthy foods. The next thing is for them to play outdoors. This is critical. Studies from around the world have shown that children that get extensive outdoor activity do have slower progression of their myopia. What does this mean? Well, it can mean an hour a day of play outdoors, and it doesn't matter what activity they do as long as their technology is left indoors. They can take a walk, walk the dog, walk their neighbor's dog, walk their little brother. It really doesn't matter. During the year, they need to do this for 12 months. And if they can't do it every day, if the weather is bad, for example, 8 to 10 hours per week year-round is what we should be looking at. In the fall, let them rake leaves. Then let them jump in the pile of leaves. In the winter, build a snowman or a snow fort. Shovel the driveway. Go down the street to a neighbor who can't shovel their own driveway and help them out. Again, year-round outdoor activity is what is needed. We also recommend using the General Shaping System, or GSS. What, you've never heard of GSS? Is it new? Well, in a sense it is. But during the 1960s, many patients who were wearing old-time hard contact lenses, would go to their eye doctor and say, you know what, I take off my hard lenses after work and I can watch TV without my glasses all evening long. The doctors listened to this statement over and over again and started to do some research. They remeasured their patient's cornea, the front surface of the eye where the contact lens rests. And they looked at these eye shapes and noticed that they were subtly changing the curvatures. So then they started to make intentional changes. Unfortunately, over the next 20 years, it was noticed that there was a minimal amount of nearsightedness that could truly be treated using this old-time version of orthokeratology. Orthokeratology is an unusual word. What does it mean? Well, ortho means change the shape of. Kera means cornea. Analogy is because we figured it out. So back in the 80s, orthokeratology really did fall out of favor because of its limitations. In the 90s, some major events occurred that allowed us to develop accelerated overnight orthokeratology. Doctors and engineers got together and developed 
new lens designs that would properly shape the cornea in a controlled manner. Materials that people could sleep in overnight became available, and the high-speed computer-driven lathes to make these designs out of these materials also were developed. Finally, the equipment to measure the changes in the cornea accurately came on the market at a price point that doctors could afford in their offices. That's how they became doing how they came to do corneal topography in their offices to monitor and measure these changes. What's the actual science behind orthokeratology? If we look at the topmost picture, we can see an eye that's behind a standard myopic lens. When looking at a faraway object, in this case a tree, the light going through the center of the lens focuses exactly like it should on the back of the eye. However, light that goes through the periphery of the lens goes to a point that focuses behind the back of the eye in the mid-peripheral range of the retina. This Focusing that is behind the back of the eye causes the eye or induces it to grow longer and more nearsighted. And so using regular glasses or regular contact lenses causes the eye to get longer and more nearsighted and causes progression. When we look at the bottom most picture, we're looking at an eye that is getting orthokeratology treatment. The corneal reshaping mold is on the cornea. The eye is looking at a tree, and not only is light going through the center of the lens and focusing on the back of the eye as it should, but peripheral light rays are also focusing on the retina. This allows the eye to slow down its level of progression, and in some cases, even halt progression for periods of time. Now, we've heard the term corneal reshaping and orthokeratology. But there's other terms that you may encounter as well, like CRT or corneal refractive therapy, corneal reshaping, gentle vision shaping, and of course, ortho -K. What do these all mean? Well, I'm here to tell you it means exactly the same thing. All these terms come down to accelerated overnight orthokeratology. It's a technique to slow progression in children. Well, we've already discussed the science behind progression and prevention, and we've already talked about the optics involved, but it is kind of a difficult subject to get your thoughts wrapped around. So look at your own hands. In this picture, we see a patient who is wearing a ring that is fairly tight. If this patient were to remove his ring, you'd see a groove underneath where it was. What he's actually done is orthokeratology on his own finger. He's used a rigid device, the ring, to slowly reshape the flexible tissue of his finger. And that's exactly what happens with ortho -K. We use a rigid device, the mold, to reshape the cornea. This allows the eye to see better and for progression to be so slowed down. Many parents ask me how safe this procedure is. We were part of a retrospective study done by Dr. Mark Bullimore when he was at Ohio State University. It was nationwide and had over 1,300 participants. At the end of the study, which was so impressive, the FDA allowed him to use his exact wording in the conclusion. It was found that ortho -K has a risk factor that is no different than soft contact lens related incidences of eye infections, and that includes microbial keratitis. In other words, wearing an ortho -K mold is no more dangerous than most soft contact lenses and actually a lot safer than those people that wear their soft lenses for 30 days in a row. Now, does this mean that a patient wearing ortho -K molds can never get an eye infection? Of course not. Anybody can get an eye infection anywhere. If your child goes to school and touches the wrong doorknob and then touches their eye, they're going to get an eye infection. But what we do in the course of our program is to make sure that we're always talking about good hygiene, always talking about care and handling, making sure that our patients are doing everything they can to succeed safely.
Does this work? Well, a lot of people ask me that question too, and there have been studies done around the world, but I'm going to talk about two of them. The first one is the SMART study, which we participated in, and it was a four-year U.S. study at 10 different locations. During the course of the four years, we measured everything we could possibly measure on over 100 kids that were doing ortho -K during that time period. We also had over 60 kids who are our control group wearing regular soft contact lenses. At the end of the study, our soft contact lens controls were five times more myopic than the kids that we treated with Ortho-K. In other words, some years the Ortho-K kids didn't change at all, and some years there were very small changes. But the soft lens wearing patients became significantly more nearsighted. Now that's a U.S. study. What you probably want to hear about is an Asian study. So we'll look at Pauline Cho's Romeo study done at Hong Kong Polytechnic. Her control group, which was wearing eyeglasses, became four times more myopic during the course of the study. She also did a second part of the study called Romeo 2, and in it she found that earlier myopic intervention using Ortho-K allowed for better control of progression. In other words, working with children at younger ages with lower amounts of nearsightedness allows for greater levels of success. Now that doesn't mean we can't work with children with higher levels that are in their teens, but this allows us to know that we can start this program at younger ages and help kids out even more. There are a lot of eye doctors in the world today. As a matter of fact, over 400,000. But of that large number, only about 1% or 4,000 actually do ortho -K full time. These are doctors that do it day in and day out. They have the right equipment and their staff is properly trained. And of that amount, only about 1,000 do advanced cases. These are dictated by unusually shaped corneas and higher levels of prescription. And an even smaller number, only about 150 eye doctors in the world today are ortho -K fellows. These are doctors that have done advanced training, advanced testing. They write about ortho -K and they teach it. And in Illinois, there are only two ortho -K fellows. And you're right, I am one of them. But let's put that aside for a minute. 20 years ago, when I started doing ortho -K on patients, I taught another doctor how to do it so we could monitor myself. And I started doing ortho -K on myself in the year 2000. Fast forward now to 2020, and beyond, I am still an Ortho-K patient. I put on my molds every single night, just like I'm going to ask your child to. So this is not something I do to your child. It's something we do together. If there's a question or a problem or a concern, I promise you I have first-hand knowledge. Can any doctor do Ortho-K? Well, the simple answer is no. There's a big difference between certification and fellowship. In order to do ortho -K in the United States today, a doctor has to do a one-hour course online, and then they can say that they're an expert in the field. That's versus fellowship, which takes years to achieve. It has a very difficult test involved, plus case presentation, and fellows are taken to task to demonstrate that they have not just adequate, but exemplary knowledge in ortho -K. Does your doctor have a good level of experience doing this procedure? I can tell you that as an FDA investigator, the many studies I've done have helped me learn more about the benefits and limitations of orthokeratology. Does your doctor have the right technology? In other words, at a minimum, can they measure corneal shape using a corneal topographer? Are they honest? Will they tell you if your child is a good candidate? or not. We have a special procedure to let us know that exact fact. And do they have the reputation and perseverance to help your child safely succeed in this treatment? We make the following promise to our patients, and that is, as an Ortho-K patient myself, I will absolutely not stop working with your child until we have safely achieved our goals. What does the general shaping system involve? 
Well, during the first year, about eight to 10 visits. We also wanna make sure that your child has really not just good patient hygiene, but great patient hygiene. And lastly, your child has to have the desire to improve. We do an in-office demonstration for them of Ortho-K. In this 15-minute demo, we'll know if they're a good candidate or not, and we'll know if they want to improve and get onto this treatment so that they're successful as well. This is a very common question, so let's take it up right now. Year one treatment starts at $2,100. Now, other cases that may be more difficult, really based on corneal shape or and or prescription, can go higher than that. But this is all discussed at our consultation, so you know what you're facing before we even start a program. This program includes all visits for one year, including the eye exam, and any changes that we have to make to the mold to achieve best vision and achieve your goals safely. At the end of the first year, we do a maintenance program. These are approximately one third the cost of the original program, and we always include a new set of molds. So if your child's eyes have changed, they get a new set of molds. And if your child's eyes have not changed, yes, they still get a new set of molds. That's an unusual thing to think about, but it's because these molds are thin, they're flexible, they can change shape and often do. And so in order for your child to be most successful, we want to change the, the mold out every year. And that way they'll see better, feel better, and have better maintenance for the years that they're on their program. And we do talk in terms of years. Studies have shown that a person's eyes can continue to get more nearsighted through high school and through college and into the mid-20s. So we want parents to know that this is a long-term proposition where we want to get children through these danger years, and when they're in their mid-20s, they can decide to stay on the program or opt for a different treatment. Lastly, health insurance, VSP, and other vision plans consider it a non-covered specialty. But if you have an HSA or an FSA or an MSA, a medical savings account, you can use that for GSS programs. Here are some commonly asked questions that I might not have taken up yet. For example, does your child need to wear their molds every night? And when is it okay to skip a night? Well, especially during the initial fitting period of approximately 90 days, we do want your child to wear the molds every night so we can establish good treatment. If they're sick and not getting out of bed the next day, if they're at a camp out or a sleepover, or for some reason flying overseas overnight, these are good excuses to miss a night. But otherwise, yes, we do want them to wear the molds every single night. What is the ideal amount of time to wear their molds, and how much is too much? We consider six to eight hours a night as a good amount of wearing time. Some, child, some children like to sleep in much later, but at about 10 hours, we get a little bit of corneal swelling, and beyond 10 hours, the eye will see a little less clearly once the molds are removed for the first hour or two of being awake. So we consider six to 10 hours the ideal sweet spot. And will they need to wear glasses or contact lenses during the day? Absolutely not. Once we've established treatment, they should be able to get through the day with needing nothing at all. And how long will they be on this program? Well, we've already talked about the study that I quoted. And yes, we do want your children on the program through the danger years that we know that their eyes can progress. So how do you know if your child does have progressive myopia? Well, some signs that that may be the case are they squinting when they're watching TV, or do they sit really close to the television? Do they need new glasses with a new prescription? every six to 12 months. And as you're walking around, ask them, hey, can you see what I see across the street? And if they can't, this is a good indication that their vision is not like it should be. I wanna thank you for joining us today to learn more about your children's eyes and progressive myopia. As always, I welcome your questions, whether you ask me at the end of today's presentation or send me an email later. Here's our contact information 
as well as our website so you can learn more about OrthoK and myopia management. And I'd like to encourage all of you to come in with your children for our free consultation.